Naomi C. Chase, Lecture in Children's Literature The Power of Insisting on In-Between by Shannon Gibney March 23, 2023 Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Marek Ozievich. I'm the Marguerite Henry Professor of Children's and Young Adult Literature at the College of Education and Human Development. And I'm a professor of literacy and I'm a literature scholar and I love the kind of books that Sharon writes, that, that Shannon writes, there are, there are books that raise questions and they keep you thinking about things long after you've read them. So um, I want to welcome everyone to this 2023 uh, Naomi C. Chase Lecture in Children's Literature. And the welcome is on behalf of Lisa Fondresek, curator of the Curlin of the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, uh, our graduate students in the Children's Literature Program, uh, and uh, Carolyn Friends. Um, so this is our 42nd uh, Chase Lecture in Children's Literature. The origin of the lecture is that a classroom teacher, uh, Naomi C. Chase, in 1950 she became professor at the University of Minnesota. And in her 26 years here at the U, she inspired generations of students. And one of the things she did, I didn't get a chance to meet her, but one of the things she did was that she and her younger colleague, uh, uh, they started a course called Writing For and By Children. And this course, this started as a summer course and it included a lecture by a children's literature author or illustrator. And eventually this lecture became an annual event and starting in, I think 1980, thanks to the generosity of Julie Jensen and a couple of other people, uh, this event became our annual Chase Lecture in Children's Literature. And um, the goal of Chase Lecture is to create a chemical reaction. So the idea is we put a children's literature author or illustrator in the same room with students, authors, uh, students, teachers, parents, readers of children's literature, and we see what happens. We talk about anything, so the author is always free to talk about whatever they choose. And, uh, and these series are so interesting because we still don't know how stories work. There's this mystery about stories and no, no matter how much we, we say about stories and how about the grammar of stories and specific types of stories, there is always something more. There's something more to be learned. And, and the thing about stories is that life is it's more interesting when we have stories, especially good stories. And this is where Shannon Gibney comes in. So I wanna introduce Shannon now, and I'm using her book, which I love also. Uh, so, uh, with, uh, so Shannon is the author of several award-winning books, including See No Color, Dream Country, and most recently, this one, The Girl I Am, Was, and Never Will Be, which I'm still, I, I finished it a couple days ago, and I'm still processing. This is such a challenging book. And this book explores themes of identity and transracial um, adoption through speculative memoir. I, had, I am a scholar of speculative fiction. I had no idea that there was a genre called speculative memoir. So this really, the book blew my mind. And um, this book offers a couple of uh, alternative chronologies of Shannon's childhood, but it also offers deep insights into how language creates realities. And these can be realities that are outside palpable realities, but also realities in our minds. Um, Shannon is faculty in English at uh, Minneapolis College. She teaches writing. She's a Bush artist and McKnight writing fellow. But most of all, she is a master wordsmith, braiding themes of identity, uh, agency, empowerment through stories. And I want to end this short introduction by reading a quote from um, this book, which goes like this. We all come from stardust, sparks of light connected by story, creating a circle of past, present, and future, ancestors, families, and you. Please help me welcome Shannon Gibney. Thank you. So Thank you. How am I gonna follow that up? That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. I was, you know, um, talking about this uh, lecture with a friend, and I was like, "Well, I don't, I don't know if anybody's gonna be there, be here." And then I was just like texting her. I was like, "Oh, there's people. There's a lot of people." Um, so thank you for for being here. Um, I have. 
I, I have notes, I have comments, I have a lecture prepared. Um, so I'm going to bring it up and we'll get this party started, as it were. And the title of my talk, I want to move this here, but I don't want things to get out of control. Well, you know what, 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 can I do this? Here, I'm just going to do this. I'll do it like this. Okay. Uh, so, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay. And I want to make sure that people streaming can also hear me. Um, so, the title of my talk is The Power of Insisting on In-Between. And I'm just going to jump right in. At the end of my most recent book, The Girl I Am Was and Never Will Be, my doppelganger, Aaron Powers, the name given to me in real life at birth, discovers the machine our birth father built to open up a wormhole between the two distinct timelines we each exist in. Aided by our uncle, Boise Christopher Collins, we bridge narrative and genre to reach our father, Boise Collins Jr., who I actually never met in real life. And I'm going to read from that uh, scene at the end of the book. If you're a spoilers person, sorry, but um, that's, that's just how it's going to go. Shannon? Yeah, turn it on. Okay. Sorry, I thought that's we were why we had it. Yeah. Okay. The overgrown generator and ancient control console makes, makes such a racket that I can barely hear my own thoughts. Boise Christopher grabs my arm. We have to turn it off, he yells in my ear. It isn't safe. I smile and shake my head. There's no way I'm turning this thing off now. I'm too close. With a shudder, I realize that this must have been what my father felt right before he disappeared, a combustible mixture of excitement and fear. Boise Christopher studies my profile. I can see he's trying to decide how to respond, which means I might not have much time. I scan the control console and find a big on button, but it is covered in an X of red tape. I move my hand to press it. No, don't, Boise Christopher yells, but I'm too fast. I hit the button with all my might. At first, nothing happens. What I mean is nothing new happens. The generator and control console are still screaming in our ears. Thank God, says Boise Christopher. You probably could have, and then it begins a low hum initially, then a rattle and a pop, a machine getting into gear, and then a whirring sound comes from the huge metal tube. It gets louder and louder with each second until it eclipses even the sound of the generator. What the fuck did you do? Boise Christopher yells at me. Only I have to read his lips because I can't hear him at all. He grabs my arm again and tries to pull me away from the council toward the door. Time to go. I shake my head and try and push him off. No, I plant my feet into the dirt and grasp the sides of the console. A crashing noise erupts behind us. I turn and see that a window has exploded, its shards ricocheting across the room. Then there is another crash and another and another. The collider or whatever it is, is exploding all the glass in the vicinity, window by window. I shriek as a shard slices my cheek. Beside me, I hear Boise Christopher gasp. Then suddenly a huge beam of light is emitted from the tube and all the glass starts breaking. The light is orange and yellow and white and is only about a foot in diameter. It has an eerie translucent glow and occasionally pops with sparks. Boise Christopher and I slowly rise from our hunched positions at the console, mesmerized by the beam. Jesus, he says, brushing off shards of glass. What is that? I walk toward the beam slowly my right hand out. Aaron, what are you going to do? He starts to walk behind me, then thinks better of it and stops. I don't answer him, because the closer I get to the beam, the more it starts to feel so familiar, until I'm right beside it and I can see her. I mean me, the other me, a teenager sitting at a table with mom over tea, and to the side of that, a kid running with two boys into the woods. I can hear her too. She is laughing and then saying, no, I know it was her. 
Aaron, stop, Boise Christopher yells. I turn to face him for a moment. He has a gash across his forehead and another on his left arm. I feel bad for dragging him into all of this. Aaron, I'm here. I whip around, my eyes huge, my heart pounding. That voice came from the beam, and that voice was him. That voice was my father. Shannon, I'm here. Him again. I think that's her name. I rush to the beam so that I'm almost touching it, and I can see my father there inside it, sitting on a park bench somewhere, looking right at me. Bright eyes, radiant brown skin, and warm smile waiting. But I sense that there's something missing, something I've forgotten. Two, aim the particle beam. Inside, that's the directions that they saw in the earlier chapter for how to get the collider going. Inside the beam, my father nods and points to the cone beside the metal tube. I run over to it and push it closer so that the beam can go through. Don't touch the beam, my father yells. I very carefully maneuver the cone after that, keeping it between the beam and me. Yes, he says, like that. Once the beam is focused, I walk back to the console and find the knob labeled low, medium, and high. Boise Christopher is beside me, and I don't know if he's seen or heard my father too, but he pats me on the shoulder and steps back. It's like he gets it now. I turn the knob all the way to high, and the beam expands twofold and begins to turn into a spiral on the wall it hits. It fizzes and sparks, and a shimmering kind of passage opens. It is mirror-like, waving back and forth. The wormhole, I whisper, the door. Completely mesmerized, I walk toward it. My father stands up from his seat on the bench and beckons me. I've been waiting for you, he says. His smile is contagious and reminds me of my son's, all the teeth perfectly lined up and shiny. The wormhole shudders a bit, the closer I get. Its sides appear to be solid, but when I touch it, there is nothing there. My hand feels like it's just touching air. He's got one trick to last a lifetime, and that's all a pony needs. It's a Paul Simon song that Aaron Stoppelganger, me, um, when she went through a wormhole, the wormhole earlier um, and met her father earlier, that song was playing in her head. Someone sings from inside. It's her. It's me, with a frizzy fourth grade afro, my hand-me-down pink and gray shorts, faded Muppet t-shirt, and broken down loafers. We are standing on the side of a busy highway somewhere inside the wormhole, dancing and singing One Trick Pony. Farther away, my father, another version of my father, stands, looking at fourth grade us incredulously. And I have the strongest feeling that this has all happened before. My father, the one maybe a foot in front of me, on the edge of the wormhole, offers his hand to me. I think of all the times in my life I have wanted to take hold of him, even for just a moment, to see if my flesh was in fact reflected in his. And now here we are. It is happening. It's okay, he says. I promise. I look back at Boise Christopher, still standing at the console. He nods. He is cut and bleeding and dirty and generally as busted up as I am, but he is here. Go, he says simply. I turn back to my father. His hand is luminous and shimmery, his nails bitten. I take a deep breath and grab his hand. Then I wait for all the atoms in my body to implode or for his hand to absorb mine or for time to start flowing backwards. It doesn't work that way, silly says fourth grade us again, laughing. Since none of that happens, I step into the wormhole entirely, still holding on to him. It's like I'm in a tube on a water slide, but it's a lot fancier. The walls continue to sizzle and spark and are a bright silver color inside. I look down to see what I'm standing on, but there is no ground. It's like we're just floating in the wormhole. I gasp, lose my balance and fall over. My father laughs. Happens to everyone, he says. Got to get your wormhole legs. I carefully bring my hands down to my sides and push on whatever is there since it isn't ground. Whatever it is, particles of some sort, pushes back on me, and in an instant, I am standing again. I look up as a kaleidoscope of lights shoots up above us, a meteor shower in a nearby galaxy, my father says. 
His hand is firm and feels as real as any other hand I have held. I close my eyes. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. He reaches up and takes my chin. Why not? He asks, looking into my eyes. Multiple timelines are always unfolding in multiple universes with infinite versions of you. I've been here for almost 15 of what you in your universe call years, watching you grow, watching you question, watching you learn and play. I pull back from him, shock clouding my face. But why, I ask. I don't understand. If that's true, this wormhole must arrest the aging process because he doesn't look a day over 35. He nods and gestures for me to follow him over to his bench. I step on nothing to nowhere and we sit down on the bench. Once we are seated, I can see two small passages right in front of us, small subtunnels of the wormhole, wormholes. I squint at the right one and can just barely make out two young white kids running and throwing things in a house. What the hell, I say, starting to get up. But my father rests his arm across my lap, stopping me. Don't, he says. They're just time loops. He shrugs, nothing to worry about. I frown at him. He has to know I have no idea what he's talking about. Is she on the other side of one of them, I ask? and I can't help the accusatory tone. My father, full of surprises, smiles. No, not at all. He waves his hand. Don't worry about her. You'll meet her soon enough. My stomach falls. I will? I grab his hand, hard. Where? When? And who is she anyway? He looks at me in confusion. You know who she is, Aaron. I eye him sideways, suddenly angry. I do not. I've been trying to find out who she is for years. My father squeezes my hand and then kisses my forehead. His lips are dry and sweet. His eyes are red, wet. She's you, sweetie. My breath catches in my throat. He looks at me sadly and nods, and also not you. I mean, it all depends on if you believe in, dis in a discrete definition of you anyway, or discrete timelines and universes after all, I've been popping in and out of the ancillary regions of this wormhole for eons, occasionally bumping into myself, which is as weird as it sounds. His eyebrows become quite animated when he talks about something that fascinates him. And he starts moving his hands everywhere. A loud snapping noise to my right jolts me. I look in the direction that it came from, and I see that the spiral has appeared, exactly like the one on my bathroom mirror 10 years ago, at the point where the wormhole and the warehouse meet. The spiral begins to churn and pop, going faster with each rotation. What in the, I whisper, shit, says my father. We have even less time than I thought. I feel my eyes become lar large saucers. What the hell does that mean, I ask. He shakes his head and grabs my hands. Listen, Aaron, I need you and Shannon to know that this whole thing, the collider, me residing here after my disappearance on your timeline and after my death on hers, all of it I did because of you. I can feel my hand actually sweating in his, which confuses me, and my head is pounding. I don't understand, Dad, I say. He smiles at the word, and I notice for the first time that crinkles appear at the corners of his eyes when he does. But then his face goes hard again, and he clasps my fingers so hard I think he might break them. Yes, I got obsessed with the possibility of opening a door to a wormhole here, in college, on this timeline but I never really believed it was possible until you, I mean Shannon, went through that time loop and found me. The one she's about to go through now, singing that Paul Simon song. That was all on her timeline, and I didn't even know it was just months before my death. I shake my head, my thoughts jumbled. You're not making sense, Dad. I don't know what this is all about. Boom! The spiral on the end of the wormhole emits a deafening rumble, and the walls begin to shake. The structural integrity can't withstand both you and me inside this at the same time, he says. He pulls me up from the bench and pulls me toward the spiral. No, Dad, please. I just got here. We are almost to its center. You have to go now. Otherwise, you might never exist, he says. But his words are getting fuzzy in my ears. We are standing on the precipice, and I can see Boise Christopher standing on the other side in the warehouse, a tiny insignificant dot in the fabric of space-time. 
just like me, just like him, just like mom, Shannon, and whoever else she has on her side. He holds my face in his hands one last time. Listen to me, baby girl. It doesn't matter who you are in this universe or any other. You're all mine, baby, all mine. And I've loved you my whole life, even before I knew you existed. I'm crying now as he pushes me away from him. It was always you, Aaron, Shannon. You are the reasons the timelines got all botched and we could meet here only for a moment. Thank God. After you came through the wormhole to meet me on that highway all those years ago, you showed me what was possible. So I built it. I built the collider, which opened the door to the wormhole. If you hadn't come and met me there, I never would have followed through. So, creaky creak. As you can see, the book is a mixture of memoir and speculative fiction. Um, and you're not the only one who doesn't know what speculative memoir is, um, because I don't really know what it is. Um, but as you say, the book is about language and the limits of language and also the possibilities of language. So um, that's what, what we did with the language as far as titling it. So the book is also about truth and fantasy. Scenes with Shannon and Aaron at various ages, occasionally seeing each other on the other side of the wormhole are interspersed with archival documents from my adoption, including letters from my adoption agency, photos of myself and various biological family members, letters from my birth mother, and even my birth father's death certificate. Uh, the final layer of the book is a series of micro essays on the absurdities of the adoptee experience like this one. And this is, uh, they're short, so this is just a quick one I'll read. It's a little over a page. The tools of mainstream literary fiction are inadequate for investigating my questions. You can get to the edge of them, but not inside them. For that, you need a wormhole and multiple timelines perhaps a doppelganger. For me, these are not manufactured literary devices. They are not lies. Uh, and yet they absolutely are manufactured literary devices. And yes, they are lies. But only insofar as our manufactured birth certificates are lies. And the stories we were told as children by our loving parents about being given up because we were quote unquote special are lies. Which is the lie? that my white birth mother knew my black father just a little and projected racist fears of predatory black men onto him when she learned I was searching for him before I found out that he had died many years before or that she was trying to protect me. Which is true, that I would have been loved but not cared for as well by my birth mother as by my solidly middle-class adoptive family. That my birth mother was not in a position to be a quote unquote good mother to me so she quote unquote did the right thing by giving me up. Or that there is no right thing when it comes to cleaving the tie between mother and child. What has become of the other me living out that first timeline with my birth mother? How are you, Erin Powers? Who was that girl and who is she now? I've never seen her and yet I see her every day. Walking my dog, she passes me her hair a little longer, a little frizzier, her eyes downcast. Leaving the grocery store, I see her smoking languidly on the steps, her Doc Martens scarred with red paint and glittery silver laces. She is funny, but reticent. She watches, but does not reveal. She holds her stories tightly. And like me, she knows that the truth is a slippery thing, that it can float in and out of what we accept as real in an instant. She could step through a wormhole at any minute and she could be me, running a cross country race at the high school, leaning into my blackness in my 20s and furiously trying to translate everything into words in my 30s. We could bump into each other on the way to meet our birth father who neither of us actually met. All of us, all of it, all the possible us's exist without explanation, answer or resolution, just like our stories. 
So I hope the overall effect of the book is one of collage. Um, it came out in January, so it's, it's been incredibly moving for me um, to experience, um, readers' experience with the book, um, which of course is similar and different um, from mine. So uh, the collage uh, uses sci uh, fiction, sci-fi, memoir, and image to get the actual experience of living as an adoptee. Someone whose sense of self is forged out of the discrete traumatic event of before or after, um, as I explore in a micro essay at the beginning of the book. Um, I think I made this, uh, I was worried that I wouldn't get to the full time here, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm not gonna read that one because I wanna make sure I get to everything. Um, I've been asked on multiple occasions how I define this book. That is, what category is it? Is it memoir? Fiction? Science fiction? Does it really fit into the YA genre? Or is it much more in the vein of adult literary fiction? This is a claim, inquiry, and anxiety I've noticed many have about my work. This question is often well-meaning, offered by those general, genuinely concerned, not only with writing across categories, but also oftentimes even more with publishing across categories. How to market and sell such a thing to an identifiable readership that hungers for it but may not know it yet. These are all good and important questions to ask if you wanna sell books, which I do. But I can't help but feel the gut punch of ninth grade me walking from the bus stop to the front of high school, track bag slung over my right shoulder, a black girl who I don't know approaching. When she reaches me, she asks, excuse me, but what are you? I remember blinking at her, perplexed for a few moments, trying to discern exactly what it was she was asking me, wanting to just keep walking past her, not even acknowledging her question, when finally understanding what she meant, answering dejectedly, I'm mixed, half black and half white. She nodded, having gotten the information she needed, the questions that prompted it no longer gnawing at her, placed as I was now in a specific category. That's what I thought, she said, but I wasn't sure. This is why 34 years later, I answered the question about what category the girl I am was and never will be with a simple statement of truth. I don't know. And then I followed it up with, and the beauty of it is that I don't have to know. The book exists now, is in the world, and I don't have to define it. It just is. This gives me a great sense of satisfaction, almost like a mic drop moment. To another interviewer I said, the book doesn't fit because I don't fit. Let's take a drink of water here. Which brings me to the main topic of the lecture. How insisting on the in-between in telling stories for and about young people is not only a formidable act of resistance, but a necessary one as well, particularly in the current moment when our politics and cultures are so polarized and fragmented. Embracing and exploring what both exceeds and exists between conventional categories of race, gender, sexual orientation, ability and disability, and yes, literary genre is a powerful intervention because it allows us to define our outsider realities. As James Baldwin famously said, People evolve a language in order to describe and thus control their circumstances, or in order to not be submerged by a reality that they cannot articulate. And as usual, it's a Baldwin quote that, as Toni Morrison said, could take up an entire novel. <laughs> that is precisely what we are doing when we insist on the in-between and in telling stories about and for young people. But first, let's get to some context, and hopefully I won't break anything uh, with uh, tech stuff here. Um, so according to a Washington Post article published in October 2021 entitled, We're Talking About a Big Powerful Phenomenon, Multiracial Americans Drive Change, there are more than 33 million Americans, about one in 10, identify as being of two or more races a number that grew by nearly 25 million people in the past decade. 
according to the 2020 census. Multiracial people span all different combinations of races and ethnicities and make up the fastest growing demographic in the country. Which is so interesting for me because, you know, I'm 48 and so when I was in you know, the 80s and 90s, it was not, this was not the situation. Let's see if I can get this up. So this is from the article. Um, more people say they're multiracial, the census numbers on race change. Um, if you can just kind of take a look at that for a minute. And then we can go the article, multiracial population growth in metro areas. I think it's also very interesting. Um, I have a lot of mixed friends and mixed people in my, in my life, and so, and I've lived here for about 18 years now, and so it's sort of, uh, the Twin Cities is like a multiracial hub here, and that's definitely reflected um, in this map here as well, of um, people identifying as more than one race um, in major metropolitan areas. Um, Richard Alba, a uh, dem demographer and professor of sociology at the City University of New York, says in the article, the mixing of all sorts of races is really a new force in 21st century America. We're talking about a big, powerful phenomenon. Um, it's hard to predict what this growth is going to do. I do not believe it's going to make our society more racially tolerant, said Reginald Daniel, a University of California at Santa Barbara sociology professor who identifies as multiracial, but is often perceived as black. But it's going to require a remaking of the way people think about race and the racial boundaries in our communities. Um, so yeah, growing up in Ann Arbor, Michigan in the 80s and 90s, I was one of just a handful of mixed kids in my classes. And there certainly wasn't much language to describe the identity or really much acknowledgement that it was an identity at all. Fast forward 30 to 40 years and mixed race identity and experience is exploding in communities across the country and not just in terms of black and white either. And if the lived experience is becoming predominant, the language has to accommodate and represent it somehow as well, particularly for young people who need to see themselves reflected in the culture around them in order to develop a solid sense of self. Uh, years ago, when I was sending out my first book, See No Color, to potential editors and publishers, a common response I got from the mostly white editors who read it was, you can write a YA novel about transracial adoption, you can write one about gender roles and families, you can write a book about baseball, you can write one about mixed race identity, but you can't write a YA novel about all of this at once which as you can imagine, made my head blow off, right? That response, um, you know, because my response was welcome to my bleep, bleep, bleep world, right? Um, because I actually do inhabit all those experiences and identities in real life. But I don't think editors and publishers would have that same response now, 15 years later, given the demographic shifts I've been highlighting and the attendant plethora of YA, middle grade, and children's picture books this has ushered in, at least I hope not. The experience itself opens up space for the art and art helps recognize and validate the experience. Thus, a snowball, effects ensue. A snowball effect can ensue and a passage like this at the end of See No Color has now entered the realm of the normal. So I don't know why I'm um, enamored with reading the ends of both of my books today, but that's what I'm going to do here. This is at the end of this book. High school would be over before I knew it. And before I left, I wanted to suck it dry of everything I could. Perhaps I would do it alone. Perhaps with a few intimate others like Kit, that's her sister. But I would no longer feel the need to eschew what had brought me into being. And what I, could, I still could neither explain no answer for, nor answer for. I would not apologize for the shame I felt in my own skin. At the same time, I recognized it and tried to see its value. 
I would no longer assume that my safest starting place in all things was my parents or my family. But the dream that some softer other space existed to hold me, all of my different conflicting parts, was now dead as well. What had taken hold instead was a longing for some kind of ever-shifting community, which I would have to carry with me wherever I went, because there was no way it could ever exist all in one place. I was mixed. I was black. I was adopted by white people and loved by them. And I loved them back, even though they didn't know so much of me, and even though this hurt me. I was a child of my birth father, but maybe not his daughter. And once upon a time, I had played ball. And once upon a time, I had let it go. All these pieces had cracked me open and brought me to this place of danger and possibility. I was ready. And what about liminal sexual and gender identities and their treatment on the page as well as in real life? According to the NPR article, these kids' authors are telling the stories of trans youth. Book bans won't stop them, published in March of last year. Bans on books about race and LGBTQ plus identities are common. Last year, stories about black American history and diversity were among the most banned or protested books in schools and libraries, according to the American Library Association. And in 2020, eight of the 10 most challenged books covered the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and so, um, list of banned books. So uh, the list of banned and challenged books as documented by Dr. Teslin Magnuson, the Every Library Institute and Every Library includes um, All Boys Aren't Blue. I'm just gonna show you. Yeah, this, this is the book, All Boys Aren't Blue. Um, and this was like a, a bestseller and is taught, of course, in schools across the country. And then, um, this one as well. A Queer History of the United States has had challenges in um, several states for young people. Gender queer um, is um, probably the most challenged um, book. Um, and this is also an award-winning uh, graphic novel. Um, a Quick and Easy Guide to Queer and Trans Identities has also been challenged um, in multiple states. So clearly the representational lives of those on the social margins of sexual, racial, and gender expressions in this country are now under a full-scale attack. As a cisgender, heterosexual woman, uh, black woman writing children's literature, I experienced this as a full-scale desire to simply erase any trace of our lives, stories, and bodies of those deemed socially deviant by the powerful and dominant classes. And this is borne out in the ongoing political violence being waged against trans kids in schools, hospitals, libraries, and all manner of institutions they navigate. Um, and so here's a cursory uh, read of top headlines of stories um, about the attack on trans kids nationwide and particularly in state legislatures. Let me see if I can bring this up. If not, I'll just read it. Okay, so here it is. So these are all from last year. Alabama is using the case that ended Roe to argue it can ban gender-affirming care. 
South Carolina becomes the latest state to enact a transgender sports ban. A judge blocks part of an Alabama law that criminalizes gender affirming medication. Texas Supreme Court okays state child abuse inquiries into the families of trans kids. Nearly half of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide. You get the point. So when you challenge assumed hierarchies just by existing, you know you are in the generative space of the in-between. It is a dangerous, often exhausting place to be. None of us want to, want to be there when we are there. None of us feels it is a gift or a window into creativity or an opportunity to explode existing regressive binaries. More often, we just feel trapped and scared and tired. But I'm arguing here for a third approach, that we can transform these social and political cages of domination by insisting on and continuing to tell our stories in this place, even if it is bruised and misunderstood, as Audre Lorde would say, even if it is challenged and we risk censorship. The space created by storytelling is a formidable push one that demands recognition. Even if we don't win every political battle for safety and equal citizenry and respect, telling these stories and getting them out widely has its own intrinsic value, and it's called freedom. I think I'm gonna end there, because I have more, but I think that's a good place to end. Okay. We'll now move to Q&A, and so we'll start with the audience here, and then we'll have probably uh, also questions from the people watching the, the, this talk online. Uh, we have two mics. Please raise your hands when you're ready with a question. No one has as any questions because I said it all. Um, why did you decide to write more um, memoirs rather than pure fiction? Yeah, so great question. I, I didn't actually um, decide to write um, The Girl I Am, Was, and Never Will Be as a memoir. It just sort of started coming out um, with bits and pieces in memoir form and bits and pieces in fiction. When I was... Um, Excuse me. When I was uh, doing my birth search um, when I was 19, and you know, shortly thereafter, whenever people would hear my stories about it, they would be like, "Wow, that's fascinating. You should totally write about that." And it just, like, I would just get the icky feeling, you know, just like I'm, I don't really want to be under somebody's microscope for their entertainment. Um, so, I, but of course, being a transracial adoptee is um, a major part of my life, major part of my identity, probably arguably the biggest part of it. Um, and so um, being a, a writer and an artist, um, of course, it's, it's always coming up in my work. Um, and so with this book, the way that the memoir part was coming up was like um, the, this other sort of, it's like a haunting almost, I think that the, the other timeline with Aaron, right, is sort of like, this, who would I have been, you know, as m many adoptees, you know, question throughout our lives, like if I had been, if circumstances had been different. Um, and a lot of times um, I start, when I'm finishing one big project, I start having dreams or things start kind of invading my subconscious. And so I started having dreams about Aaron you know, and that's sort of when I knew, like, okay, I think this is going to be my, this is the next thing that's coming. Yeah, I hope I answered that. Okay. Which one was your uh, favorite book to write and why? Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, you know what? I actually think 
this one, the girl I am was and never will be because, um, you know, I identify as a black nerd um, and I could just go off in this book. Like, wormholes, you know, there's a whole section on, like, Loki is a transracial adoptee, you know, which it irritates me that nobody recognizes that he's a transracial adoptee. Um, and, and um, I, yeah, so I just got to nerd out um, and also um, just had a lot of fun. Like, people have said it's been interesting since the book's been out. It's, like, all these really heavy topics, right? I mean, it's really about I – mean, it's about a lot of things, but it's really about also intergenerational trauma, right, and, and, and loss and how does that – get passed down, right? And, and when things get, kinship ties get broken, what is left, right? Which, those are all very heavy topics. But uh, then people have also said that there's a, a lightness to the book that they weren't expecting because I think of those, like, speculative elements and, you know, elements, like, with my brothers and other kids in the woods and stuff. So, um, and other books, like Dream Country, which was the book I wrote before this, which is about five generations of a Liberian and Liberian American family. And it's over 200 years, five different narrators. I mean, that book kicked my ass. It, it was really hard. And it took me, I would say, I spent 10 years trying not to write it. And then I spent 10 years writing it. Um, and so this book just like, because I, I had to do all my research because I'm not, I'm obviously not Liberian. Um, and this book required like almost no research because I know my own experience, so that was that was really nice. Um, and I wrote a lot of it during the pandemic, which was fun to have a project um, during that time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so can you talk a little about how race and class intersect in your story? I note that you mention your adoptive family being middle class, mm -hmm. and so I'm just curious how that's important. What is that significant? Well, I think especially in adoption, I mean, sort of the elephant in the room that is fairly obvious, but nobody really wants to come out and say, is that it, it's a, a class transaction. I mean, it's, you, you know, you, you're taking usually a child uh, from lower class uh, status, and then they're moving up to middle class or even upper class status. Um, and so that definitely happened with me. You know, my white adoptive family when I was a kid, like we were more like lower middle class. But then as, you know, time went on, um, and I would say probably by my teens, like we were definitely upper middle class for sure. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that when you read the Erin sections, right, and there's um, some, there's one part where she talks about like, you know, her aunt and uncle coming to her, you know, apartment with her, that, where she lives with her mother and bringing groceries because her mom didn't, didn't have money for that, right? Um, so you, you do get the sense of, like, it, it just that Erin is in a more precarious situation than Shannon is in a lot of different ways, um, which was something that I wasn't necessarily expecting when I started, I didn't know that before I started writing it, yeah. Um, and my editor and I had a lot of talks about that because it's like, okay, you know, we had to be clear, like, Aaron is not just this, like, you know, sub-character of Shannon. Like, who is Aaron? She has to be her own, her own person. Um, and so that, that requires really digging into those, those places as well. Yeah, thank you. We've got a few in the chat. So I'll okay. grab one of those. This is um, this from Marika. Yeah. She is asking, um, wondering if you could talk more about the tension between made-up literary devices and lies <laughs> that they aren't and are. What does it open that is the tension and how did it influence your genre blending with speculative memoir? Great question, wow. Um, I mean, I think particularly as an adoptee, like we're constantly being given um, it, what little information that we have um, about our origins, um, about our home communities and our biological families. I mean, it's always contingent. You know, you just, <laughs> oh, well, I know this now, right? And, you know, I would say it's like every family is like this, but certainly um, adoptees probably have, you know, two, three, four, five times as many holes as as other folks do. Um, and so what do you, 
what do you do with that? Um, and <laughs> you know, it's so interesting when we think about like literary devices and nonfiction and sort of like, Oh, what's true and what's not, but it's always being constructed. Every, whatever you put down in the page, you're constructing it, you know, from your point of view. Um, there's something that's going to get left out. Um, so, um, I always say that I feel like my first job and really honestly any writer or artist's first job and first allegiance has to be to the truth, to telling the truth. And if you're not doing that, I don't, I don't really know what you're doing. Um, like why, why write? I don't, I don't understand that. Um, but, um, so, but it, you know, but that's messy, right? Everybody has their different, their different truths. And so I think, you know, um, with some of these literary devices, it's sort of like, oh, well, it's memoir, and so it's, you know, it's, it's more truthful, it's more aligned with the truth than fiction, but why? Why do we think that? Not necessarily. So I just think that there's like all these interesting crossovers between adoptee experience um, that is of um, story, right, that is contingent. And then our fundamental beliefs about like, oh, the truth of these literary genres and devices. Yeah. Um, hi. Hi. So I have kind of a two-part question for you. Yeah. Um, reading Dream Country, uh, I just felt like you covered so many different um, perspectives and narratives, and I loved that. And I was curious, you mentioned being like one of the few mixed kids growing up in Ann Arbor. What are some things or some authors or some books or some media that when you were younger, uh, maybe you started to see yourself or if you didn't see yourself anywhere, um, like is, is that part of what dream country is? I, so kind of a two-part question, like who are the authors and what is the media that you think would connect with people that feel left out now because they connected with you and you felt left out? And then also is part of that book for more people to be able to see themselves in literature? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Um, so I'll answer the second part of the question first. Um, and it's so interesting. Like, I mean, I would say like I'm a mid-career writer now. Um, and so I've got a bunch of books sort of behind me and hopefully a bunch more <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> but, um, but it's like... Um, I always knew that some of my themes, my major themes in my work is like, you know, let's say race, family, belonging. But what I didn't know, like what starts to happen is you start to get this body of work and then you start to see patterns. Other people start to see patterns in your work. They, like actually the unconscious is a beast, right? And so you, you maybe didn't even see them. So, you know, one of the epigraphs for Dream Country is that quote from Sidia Hartman, for, for me, the rupture was the story. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so I didn't know until I finished Dream Country um, and it was out in the world that so many of, so much of what drives me as a writer and an artist is like exploring those ruptures. And whether the ruptures are mine, you know, my own story, or whether they belong to others, or like, I would say Dream Country is sort of like a collective exploration of the ruptures in the African diaspora through this one his specific historical example um, of the African American and Liberian en encounters. Um, and so for that, I definitely feel like, um, yeah, I mean, that really is a story that, I mean, especially since that book's been out, people are like, I, I never knew of the American Colonization Society. I had no idea that Liberia was colonized by African Americans. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know about the, you know, some of the history in Liberia and the forced labor and like all the, these things. So, um, and I also have had people too who are like, I really like that that book is set, like the contemporary parts of it are set in like Brooklyn Center. They're like, I've never read 
anything said in Brooklyn Center, right? Like, it, right? It's like this idea that, like, no, you know, things have to be said in, like, New York City to be, you know, a real story or something, which is so irritating. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so I think that there's multiple levels at which that's happening in that book, hopefully. Um, and, that, and that has come back to me. I mean, uh, one of the most moving parts of that book being out has been young um, African immigrants in the Twin Cities who, who are like, we know, like the Coley section, you know, they're like, we know this kid. We know this guy, but we've never seen him in a book. And I'm like, okay, well, then I'm, I'm doing my job. Like, that's... I don't care what the critics say. I don't care how many books I sell. I'm glad I wrote that book. I'm glad it kicked my ass because that's worth it, you know? Um, my brain, the other part of the question. Like things that inspired you when you were young? Um, yeah, it was, there really honestly wasn't much about mixed race stuff when I was growing up. There was this one, book that I kind of latched onto early on by Michael Doris called A Yellow Raft and Blue Water. And, and it's about this um, mixed girl and she's half black, half native. Um, and that was one of the first things that I read that actually had a mixed protagonist, even though she wasn't exactly mixed in the way that I was. Um, and so that, that book made a big impression on me. Um, and then like, sounds ridiculous, but you know, like, um, Lisa Bonet, right? Like she was big in a different world and the the Cosby show at that time. And so that was actually like a point of, oh, there's somebody who kind of looks like me. And then it, it got irritating because people would be like, you look just like Lisa Bonet. And it's like, you know, it's like this whole thing of like, you know, still in middle age, I'll be out with my mixed girlfriends and people will be like, oh, are you sisters? Like, no, we're just all mixed, like whatever. So, yeah, so. Yeah, thank you. Somebody else? Yeah, uh, I had a question about, I know you talked about shame, um, and I was kind of wondering if you would, if you're comfortable like going through um, what kind of helped you overcome that situation, and then how you dealt with people around you um, dealing with you overcoming that shame and kind of becoming yourself more, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think what really helped, honestly, was meeting other adoptees, other transracial adoptees, um, and finding out, you know, you feel like you're such a freak because it's such a structurally isolating experience, and it's designed to be that way, right? And so, you know, I actually grew up with other transracial adoptees, but we didn't have any language to uh, identify that or discuss our uh, experiences, um, and so I think, you know, in my twenties, actually meeting other black adoptees, other, you know, I have a lot of friends who are Korean adoptees and, um, and even though that experience is different than, uh, being a domestically adopted, uh, mixed black transracial adoptee, like the, the sense of isolation and racial, racial isolation and, and not knowing how to perform the culture that you phenotypically look like, that's where the shame comes in. And so I think there's a few things. So one thing is, um, you know, just coming to realize like, oh, I'm not actually a freak, I'm an archetype. Like this is what happens when people are raised, when, when, when a black person or a person of color is raised by white people. This is what happens psychologically. So it becomes impersonal. It's like, I don't have to actually carry that. Then the other thing that's happened, as I said, you know, I'm a woman of a certain age now, right? And so it's like, you know, when I was coming up, it's like, well, I didn't necessarily, I couldn't speak black English because I wasn't around black people. But now, 30 years on, I've been around a lot of black people, right? So I can speak black English, you know, um, and, you know, all the things. I've, li you know, black music, black culture, you know, tons of black people in my life, right? So um, th there's, not, there's not that kind of shame around it. Um, and I also think the other thing is, is like just recognizing what happens. Um, I think 
the real reason why I'm so, well, okay, I'm committed. I'm so committed to telling the truth because it just feels like I have, an imperative, like I have to. But the other thing that sort of gives me energy about that is what happens when other people see you constantly telling the truth, even when it's inconvenient, right? Like you're with a group of uh, like black social peers or something. It's, yeah, I was adopted. My parents are white. Oh, you know, not like you have to just, you know, like shock people or whatever, but it's like, I'm not going to hide it, right? Like this is who I am. I didn't make this world. <laughs> I didn't decide, right, to get adopted by white people, but this is what happened, right? Um, then it just makes other people like, oh, well, maybe I can talk about this other thing that doesn't fit with, like, conventional ideas of blackness, which are whack anyway, right? So, yeah. Thank you. We've got a lot in the chat. Oh, boy. But okay. I'm, well, there's two that are kind of similar. Olivia is asking about your writing process. And Amanda is as well, and I'll read Amanda's. Um, Amanda says, this might be a loaded question, but as an adoptee and an actor and someone who would love to write a play or book about my story, where would you advise I start? I am wondering how that process was for you. And then Olivia is kind of wondering about your process. Okay, yeah. So, um, you know, writers have to read a ton. Uh, widely and um, deeply um, and don't ever let anybody tell you that what you like isn't worth reading. If you like reading romance novels, you know, I hate romance novels, but some people love them. If you love them, read them. If you love sci-fi, read it, watch it. If you, you know, don't let people, oh, well, that's not real literature. Like, well, it is to me, whatever. Um, so you, you, you're going to have to read a lot. And then um, you need to study your, your form. You know, you need to take writing classes. Uh, we have the Loft Literary Center here, which is a wonderful resource uh, for people. They do have sliding scale uh, options for people if money is a problem. Um, also, the libraries here also offer wonderful free workshops um, if you go on their events page. Um, so, and, and a lot of these places have virtual online options as well. Um, so there's, there's a, I feel like there's a lot of support, actually, um, in this community um, for, for folks to develop um, their, their writing skills. Um, and yeah, for me, um, my, pro my writing process, um, <laughs> I have really tried my whole life to develop my craft to the utmost ability so that then when I sit down to write, I can more easily hook into whatever you want to call it, the creative unconscious. Some people call it um, God, maybe. Some people call I mean, I don't know what it is. And I, I hate talking about this stuff because I sound like, you know, whatever. But, um, but, you know, I mean, it's why, like, somebody reads something of yours and they're like, oh, and this theme and I saw this and that. And you're just like, I did not even see that. I don't, I don't know where that came from. Because it didn't actually come from you. It didn't come from me. You're hooking into something deeper than yourself. Um, but in order to do that, you have to have like really great craft chops. Um, so, so that's what I, I mean, there's no shortcuts. It's just, there's no shortcuts. And then there's a difference between writing and publishing. I don't know much about playwriting, but, um, but you know, Playwright Center here too, right? We have like great resources for that as well. Um, and you have your last question right here. Okay, great. Thank you. Wow. A lot of pressure for being the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Better be good. I, I hope so. Okay, so <laughs> my question is, well, first off, you emphasize a lot about speaking truth in your writing, and that's your whole purpose as a writer, to show and speak the truth. Um, what would you say about how to find the truth in works of literature that don't do that? Like writers who don't share the truth through their writing, um, how would you say, like, if as a reader, how do you find the truth within, like, the so-called lies or not truths? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm sort of turning it over in my mind here. I mean, I, I mean, I feel like if I'm reading a work of literature and it doesn't reflect some kind of fundamental truth about the human condition, I mean, I'm going to put it down. 
unless I'm a student and it's assigned and I have to read it. I've been there, done that. That part of my life is now over. I loved school, I did love school. But yeah, now I'm glad it's over. Um, or I'm on the other side of school. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it's just not gonna be good. Like people, people kind of tell on themselves, you know? Like, um, and something can be, I mean, we talked about this, I remember having discussions about this in my like MFA program, right? Something can be like this beautifully crafted box, you know, it's, it's elegant and it's, you know, so well put together. But then if there's nothing inside it, who cares, you know? Um, there, there has to be something there. That's what I would say. Yeah, and that's why I feel like along with my talk, it's not like you can't be from like dominant categories and not write meaningful, good stuff. But you're gonna have to go someplace uncomfortable to get there. Yeah. Mic drop, no. <laughs> thank you, Shannon. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all.